I'm joined today by Evan Fraser, who's a Canada Research Chair in Global Food Security and a Professor of Geography at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Evan, I have so much I want to ask you about. Let, let's start sort of more generally with food security and uh, food supply. Uh, how uh, scared or cautious is realistic to be uh, about how quickly an interruption to the food supply would affect end users who are used to just going to the grocery store and and buying food whenever it is that they're hungry or want to buy food. So that's, that's a great question, David. Um, on, on one level, things ought to be concerning to us. Uh, if you think of how much food, say, we have in a city, uh, there's really not that much. And so if we imagined anything stopping our uh, ability to import food, things could unravel pretty quickly. And we've got cases like uh, like Hurricane Katrina, where, where people ran out of, of products very, very quickly. So often we say we've got about three days of food in a city. Or um, or about 10 years, a little more than 10 years ago, there was a, a, a truck driver strike in the UK uh, that caused mass panicked buying on the supermarkets. And, 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 and people were really concerned that things were going to unravel pretty fast. On the other side of the coin, when you actually look at situations where you've got say, food riots erupting in the streets, say in Venezuela today, or, uh, or in Haiti in 2008, or in Cameroon in 2008, uh, you actually don't see much of a, it's actually most of those food riots aren't caused by running out of food. It's caused often because food prices become volatile and that exposes other things going wrong, like political corruption or urban unemployment. And, uh, and what looks like a food riot actually is, is a protest about other political and economic things. You mentioned three days, and that's interesting because earlier this week we interviewed a, a survival expert and we asked him sort of about, you know, the there's sort of a range in terms of how prepared people sometimes are with regard to food or other supplies for emergencies. Some people are totally unprepared and then you have some sometimes influenced by religion. We know Mormons like to do prepping, but you have like extreme prepping. You might have up to a year of non-perishable food ready. And the survival expert Thomas Coyne said, listen, the way I work is uh, I suggest people plan for scenarios that have happened before. We can all imagine so-called worst case scenarios, but 72 hours was what he said. And you're talking about uh, that, that we seem to have about a three day food supply before interruptions would be noticeable. So is there something to that, to this three day idea? So. I don't honestly know that that becomes an analytic question and I don't know if anybody has actually done the research to say if you've got a major disruption in the food system if you've got three days of uh, of supplies does stability remain I don't that's a that's a, like a, an experimental question that I don't think anyone's tested mm. uh, I say three days because uh, there was a journalist a number of years ago now that said civilization is nine meals away from anarchy or, or three days and that was a that was a, a comment that was picked up by a British politician in the wake of the the, the truck driver strike in the UK about like that I mentioned a minute ago that happened about 10 years ago and uh, this notion that we are nine meals from anarchy is uh, is kind of like a nice nice convenient meme as a rule of thumb it makes sense to me I, I think that most of our major services would probably come back on within 72 hours uh, or at least society would mobilize a developed society anyways would mobilize a response within 72 hours. So let's talk a little bit about worldwide food production and sort of how it relates in a way that is either logical or not logical when compared to what we know to be relatively healthy diets. In other words, to phrase it a different way, is the world producing foods sort of in parity or concert with what we know to be relatively healthy diets? So, David, another another super question. Um, there's a bunch of ways you can answer that. At, at, a, at a really crude level, you can just measure the calories available on the planet. And uh, if you imagine perfect distribution, we actually have more than enough. Uh, according to the United Nations statistics, there's about 2,850 calories available per person per day. So that's 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 tons. Most of us, on average, should eat about 22 or 2,300, depending on our age, our gender, and our level of activity. Uh, so there's lots at a calorie level, but way too many of those calories at a global level are um, our cereals, our sugars, or our fats. And, and we really overproduce those kinds of foods. Whereas uh, if you think of those eight to 10 servings of fruit and veg a day, uh, there simply isn't enough fruit and vegetable for us all to eat a, a nutritious diet. And, and, and work that I've been doing just 
you know, just today I was working on this data, is when you go through global production data and you convert those tons of carrots and, and kilograms of lettuce that, that we produce into servings, there's actually only about three servings of vegetable and fruit per person per day on the planet. So we're really underproducing fruits and vegetables. And as a result, we see that there's a mismatch between what we're producing and what we know we need to be eating. And, and that mismatch sort of sits at the, at the foundation or at the basis of this worldwide epidemic we have about obesity and, and type 2 diabetes and, and, and people being overweight. So let's go back to that first sort of crude number you gave us, which is 2,800 or so calories per person being produced per day. Uh, on average, 22 to 2300 calories uh, of consumption. That to me sort of confirms, although maybe not distributed amongst the right foods, as you mentioned, but it sort of confirms all of the reports I've read, which say that hunger in the world is fundamentally a distribution and resource allocation issue. When you consider how much food is thrown out at supermarkets, when you consider food waste in the average home in developed countries, et cetera. Is that your sense? I mean, is is hunger on our planet fundamentally an issue of, of lack of political will to fix it and and distribution and allocation or is there more to it? So in my opinion, it is hunger today is not an issue of production. Uh, and, and I don't see a scenario in the future where it really results where hunger really results from 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 underproduction. Hunger is a result, as you, as you just said, David, as a result of dis distribution and politics. I would also add infrastructure in there. So if you, um, if, if you uh, imagine, uh, say, a, a female farmer on a rural hillside in Malawi, um, actually taking the, the food they produce and, and getting it to market or storing it for long enough to be able to, uh, without it going bad, th those sort of basic infrastructure and access to market issues. Uh, are very significant in causing hunger amongst the, the the bottom billion, you know, the poorest billion people on the planet. I mean, the World Health Organization just recently updated its statistics on on hunger and nutrition, and uh, and they now figure that there's close to 1.9 billion overweight or, or obese people on the planet using a a body mass index calculation. Where the, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, there's about 800 million who are remain mired in undernutrition. So we live in a world of stuffed and starved, and uh, and and really, production isn't is it is not going to change that. Increasing production isn't going to change that. Okay, a couple other things I want to touch on with you, and really, there, there's so much we could discuss. I want to get to your thoughts on a, on another possible dust bowl, but before we do that. The, the documentary film Cowspiracy uh, recently has created what many feel is a sort of overdue conversation about the connection between uh, m the raising of meat for human consumption and climate change and emissions. And Cowspiracy went even further to say not only is this an issue, but there's actually a sort of conspiracy or collusion among uh, every, you know, spanning both government and big food. Uh, to actually not talk about that so that maybe people don't realize it or action isn't taken about it. I know you've written about emissions in agriculture. What is a sort of balanced and nuanced view on the issue of of meat, but more generally of of emissions and raising of other types of food as well, including produce? So the general rule of thumb is that agriculture causes about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a major component of that is actually land use change, so cutting forests down and plowing them for soybeans, uh, and that's probably the single biggest contributor uh, that the agri-food system gives to greenhouse gas emissions. The second would be livestock production, and in particular, um, ruminant animals, so cows, which would be the most numerous, but also sheep. Uh, and the reason for that is is they are they are, they they have these ruminant digestive systems that involve chewing and swallowing, and then chew, spitting back up the cud and keeping on chewing, and that and that's system creates a lot of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas emission. So I would agree with the, um, the cow conspiracy uh, arg argument in as much as we have to acknowledge that a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions is our livestock system and, and a major contributor of our livestock is are the ruminants and the, and the beef. And I say this as someone who loves steak and ice cream, so it's, I don't take any pleasure in, 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 in reporting these, these analyses, but this is what the analysis says. Moving into the future, if we imagine a world where, um, where we put a price on carbon, whether that's a carbon tax or a cap and trade system or whatever, we imagine some sort of mechanism to put a price on carbon, it will have the effect of raising um, uh, the price of ruminant animals. Uh, so beef prices, dairy will go up it, to consumers. 
And we know from, uh, from consumer studies that consumers are quite elastic in terms of what they, when prices rise for one category of protein, they'll quickly shift to another. And there's such a big drop when you go to um, aquaculture and, and, and poultry and eggs. And then there's a huge drop in greenhouse gas emissions when you go to, say, legumes and vegetarian-based, vegetable-based proteins. So my guess is if we imagine this future, which I don't think is that radical, where we start paying a price for carbon, um, that that will create strong opportunities in the market for food processors, food scientists to start experimenting more with meat substitutes. And, and, and it, it might not be a, it won't be a complete cutting off of meat, but it will be things like putting soybeans into, beer, into uh, ground beef to make mixed soybean beef burgers. Hmm. And uh, I've got a group of students that are doing things like that. And you can reduce the content of a burger, uh, the beef content of a burger, without now affecting much in the way of taste or, or the consumer's enjoyment of it. And my, my prediction is that, uh, is that as we move forward into a world where we start paying for the price of our climate change through a carbon tax or something like that, we will see greater innovation at the low carbon end of the protein spectrum. And we'll see things like mixtures of soy, soybeans and legumes in, in our beef burgers and, and in our chicken nuggets and stuff like that. Last thing, and I wish I had more time for this. We don't, but I do want to get just your quick thoughts on it so our audience can research more if they're interested. Uh, what is a dust bowl and why are you worried about another one? So the Dust Bowl happened in the U.S. in the 1930s when two bad things happened. One, a, a, a bottoming out of the economic system in the Great Depression and, and a big bad drought that affected you know, millions of hectares of land in the American Midwest. And the confluence of that sort of perfect storm of economic and environmental problems triggered mass migration and, and, and serious unrest uh, across the U.S. And you, you have to see both the depression and the drought in, as, as part, of, part of the same narrative. Um, or part of the same story. So that's the concern. Can we see a return to that? And if we think of a future where the economic system is not stable in large parts of the world and where the environment isn't stable in large parts of the world, we could see a re-emergence of that kind of confluence where you've got uh, 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 no economic alternatives for poor farmers, so they farm the land harder, which means they're more vulnerable to drought, so when the drought comes, the land blows away and they're left with nothing. Uh, and I, I can see, imagine parts of the world where that kind of scenario could could play out again. Um, will it happen in the American Midwest? My, my guess is no. This, the, the farming practices are different. The safety nets are different. Um, technology is completely different. So am I worried about um, the, the, the Midwest blowing away again and, and hundreds of thousands of refugees from Iowa walking to California? Uh, I don't think that's a realistic scenario. No, at minimum, they wouldn't be walking to California. That that we could say uh, <laughs> with some certainty. Uh, Evan Fraser, professor of geography at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you. Appreciate the call.